The new HBO show Perry Mason starts off a few days after Christmas in 1931. Most of the country is having to deal with the Great Depression, but not Los Angeles. It's it's like it isn't even affected. And one of the reasons for that is the booming film industry. And Perry Mason is a private investigator on a job having to tail one of those film stars because the studio has hired him to try to catch him in a morality clause. Basically, anything this guy gets caught doing that's immoral, it'll void his contract and the company doesn't have to pay him. So Perry Mason and his friend Pete Strickland have been tailing this guy for a few days, catching him in nothing, following him from restaurants to a movie theater where he watches his own movies, and then finally one night they catch him walking into an apartment complex, and they notice that he's greeted by another familiar Hollywood starlet. So Mason sneaks in and sees that this guy is covering her in food and going down on her, and that seems pretty immoral, so Mason snaps a couple of photos, but does end up getting caught and has to flee the apartment in the nick of time. He then heads home, and his home is right off of an airstrip that's used for sightseeing tours. And he's greeted at his house by a Christmas package that was returned to sender. Mason had sent the package to his nine-year-old son who's living with his mother, and the sight of the package pisses him off. Later that day, his attorney slash mentor, E.B. Jonathan, pops in. Mason can't figure out exactly how he was able to pop in, because you have to get through a security gate to get to his house, and E.B. just sweet-talked the guy for the code. And E.B. might have a job for Mason. He's been contacted by a mogul named Herman Baggerly, who goes to the same church as this couple that has had to deal with some tragedy in their life. Emily and Matthew Dodson are pretty simple people whose child was kidnapped and held at ransom. The kidnappers asked for $100,000, which in 1931 is a ton of money, and somehow the Dodsons were able to get it. They were held up in an abandoned building and instructed to leave the money and the child would be put on a trolley that heads down street. The Dodsons were then supposed to pick up the child and then be on their way. But when the trolley started heading down street, the Dotsons went to go pick up the kid. The kid was on the trolley, but little Charlie was dead and his eyes were sewn open. So this case could be really big, not just for Perry Mason, but for E.B. Jonathan as well. Problem is, Perry Mason's schedule's a little full today, but E.B. urges him to make some time and meet with Badgerly. Now, one of those places that Mason had to go that day was to the Hollywood studios to get paid for the pictures of the guy in the morality clause. And they both agreed that if he could come through with the pictures, he would get paid $200. But he thinks he should get paid more because he also has pictures of their new Hollywood starlet, and that's who the guy was going down on. So the one exec lets him know that he has to run this up the flagpole for approval and he'll be in touch. But it's obvious that he is not happy that Mason has caught their new Hollywood starlet in a compromising position. The other thing he's doing is getting paid to serve as a material witness in one of the cases. But when he gets there and goes to testify, the cross-examiner starts ripping into him about his line of work, his service record, assaulting a guy. And the more questions he asks, the more Mason gets pissed off at the other attorney is not stepping in and objecting to anything. To the point where Mason at one point has to scream his name just to say objection. Now during the Inquisition, he does notice Della Street, who is Evie Jonathan's legal secretary in the back. And she's been sent there to get him to take him to the meeting with Herman Baggerly. So he heads to meet with Herman Baggerly and gets the scoop on the story and finds out that they are from the same church. And it's this church on the radio that sounds too good to be true. It's run by a woman named Sister Alice. But because of it, he met the Dodsons and he wants to help. Mason asks him, why are you going to us? Why aren't you just going to the cops? And Baggerly says, honestly, it's because I don't trust the cops. Mason agrees. That's probably the right move. Baggerly tells him that the Dodsons are expecting them. But when they both head over there, Matthew Dodson is getting sick of being questioned. And more so, getting sick of being questioned as if he's a suspect. It gets to the point where Jonathan realizes he needs to take a break. And as he's doing so... Mason is walking around the house taking pictures and notices that they do have a picture of Sister Alice, the same evangelical radio host that Baggerly was talking about. Eventually, the investigation leads up to baby Charlie's room where he's greeted by Mrs. Dotson. And she makes mention that she really wants to clean the room because she feels like it reflects poorly on her how dirty it is. He says, no, I don't think poorly of you at all. She then mentions how she feels like she's being punished by God for this and asks Mason if he has a son, which he does, a nine-year-old. And the more the two start talking about what each other's child likes... She gets more emotional and has to leave. After they talk to the Dodsons, Mason, E.B., and Della head back to E.B.'s office and start going over their story. And the thing that Mason is hung up on is the same thing the cops are hung up on. Where did this guy who's a simple grocer get $100,000? The other thing he can't understand is Mrs. Dodson's story. She put baby Charlie to bed. She headed downstairs to clean some dishes. She headed back upstairs. She came back downstairs, fell asleep near the radio, and never once woke up when someone broke into her house and stole her child. Because of that, he's leaning towards it being an inside job, which is what the cops are leaning towards, although he's not willing to hang his hat on it. Mason makes mention that whoever did this must have cased the place for months to know Mr. Dotson's schedule and what time Mrs. Dotson would put Charlie down. 
EB wants him to go to the place where the crime went down and look around, see if he can find out some things. And he says, I'll do it, but the cops aren't going to appreciate me looking over their shoulder. And I have a private investigator's license to think about that could be revoked. But Mason's broke and he's willing to do it. That night, he hooks up with a local pilot from the airstrip and the relationship is nothing more than physical. In fact, she's kind of rude to him. As she's leaving, she offers him money to buy the farm that he lives on, but he's not willing to do it because it's his family farm and his dad built it with his own hands. The next day, he does head to the trolley where the crime occurred, starts poking around, taking some pictures, talking to a few cops, and then he heads up to the building where the Dotsons were instructed to leave the money. Thinking that he would be the only one there, he's not. He's greeted by Detective Holcomb and a cop named Ennis. And Holcomb seems okay with Mason, but Ennis seems like a rabid dog. Holcomb tells Mason, look, if you have any information on this case that would help them, probably should let us know because right now our guy is Matthew Dodson. So Mason tells him that as the trolley was heading down, there was a car that raced up the street and actually clipped the trolley. The local traffic cops saw it happen and didn't really think anything of it at the time, but that's probably because cops are stupid. And when Mason says that, Ennis takes offense, but Holcomb calms him down and says go check it out now it's just holcomb and mason in the room together and holcomb offers him five bucks for the tip but mason won't take it because he's annoyed about the fact that the lapd is so dead set on pinning this on matthew dodson even though they don't actually know if he did it or not they just need a fall guy for it so holcomb puts the five dollars away and says look you can enjoy being cop in here and you can take your pictures but i'm going to find out that matthew dodson did this and then he leaves. Mason stays in the building taking some pictures and then afterwards he heads to the coroner's office. And he's been to the coroner's office before anytime he needs cheap clothing. Kind of an early thrift shop. Coroner sells him clothes from the dead that have no family and can't pick it up. So it's a win-win for both sides. But Mason heads there this time to check out the body of baby Charlie. Before he's able to do so though, he checks his messages and finds out that the Hollywood execs have left him two tickets for their New Year's Eve party that night, and he thinks, sweet, I'm going to get paid for the pictures. He then gets the okay to check out baby Charlie's body, but when the coroner pulls out the body, Mason is shook, and it is an uncomfortable scene. Even though Mason is visibly upset by the scene of a dead baby, he is able to procure one of the threads that was used to sew the baby's eyes open. He then heads to that New Year's Eve party, but he's not in the right state of mind. Because he had two tickets, he invited Pete Strickland, who helped him on the case. Pete's having a great time. I mean, there's Hollywood stars all over the place, and he can't figure out why Mason's not having a good time. And that's when Mason lets him know that he saw the body. He then gets word to go meet with the Hollywood execs. And one of the guys actually runs the company. The other guy he met with earlier. And then there are two guys who look like you wouldn't want to run into them in the back alley. And after the execs get the photos and the negatives, they let him know that they're only going to pay him $200 because that was the agreed upon price. Minus $199 for the bullshit that he put him through. They then have the two goons put a barrel of a gun on his chest that was being heated up via a lighter. So it burns Mason and Mason is forced to hobble back into the party where he sees Pete and Pete wants to know if he got the money. But he says, no, I overplayed my hand and gives him the dollar. And as the clock strikes midnight and everyone's celebrating 1932, Pete Strickland is yelling at Mason because Pete has a family to think about here. And who can blame him? He thought he was going to get 300 bucks, and he just got $299 less. Now, as Mason was getting screwed over by the execs, the three people that were actually responsible for baby Charlie's kidnapping and death are hiding out in a room. And one of the guys' sketch is all over the newspapers, but it's pretty vague. It's really just a guy in a hat. Because of that, he's still wearing that hat. And these three guys are waiting for somebody. But when that guy shows up, it's Detective Ennis because he was in on it the whole time. And because of the fact that Mason knows about the car and the one guy sketches all over the newspaper, he starts shooting them all. But one of the guys is able to get away. And as Ennis is chasing him up some rooftops, the guy tries to hop one of the roofs onto another, but ends up falling and we assume died from the injuries. Mason, on the other hand, headed back home after the party and gets rip-roaring drunk. He even tries to call his ex-wife to wake up their son, but she's not willing to do that because he's sleeping and he's getting more and more pissed off. That pilot that he hooks up with tells him that he looks like a fool right now and instead of hooking up with her, he ends up going into the other room and laying out all of the evidence that he has in front of him to dive into this case. In episode two, the Dotsons head to a church service with Sister Alice. It's the same service that she holds every week that's also broadcast on the radio. Afterwards, they get to meet Sister Alice because she heard of what happened to baby Charlie. One of the guys in this private meeting is Herman Baggerly. He lets them know that if it's okay with them, they'd like to have the funeral ceremony at the church. The elders have also discussed it, and they're willing to pay for all of the expenses. The meeting is then interrupted by the police who come in and tell the Dodsons that they have a lineup to show them, and they have to come down to the station. When they arrive, there is no lineup. And because of this, EB is pissed. He's very annoyed that he wasn't warned beforehand that his client was being brought in to be questioned, but Matthew says, it's fine, I want to help out. And they question him about a suitcase that looks an awful lot like his own suitcase, but it has a bullet hole in it. And Matthew does confirm that, other than the bullet hole, yeah, it looks like his. EBS, where did you even get this? 
and Ennis tells him that he found it in an abandoned building with two other dead bodies. The district attorney then walks in and tells Matthew and E.B. that they think that the two dead bodies that were found had something to do with baby Charlie's death. He then asks Dotson if he has a gun, and Matthew can't see what's going on, but E.B. can and tries to shut it down, getting his client out of there, but they keep on questioning him. The district attorney asks, where were you the night that Charlie was taken? And he says, I told you guys already, I was at the store. But the problem is they have a patrolman who stopped by the store twice that night and didn't see Matthew. And they also have an eyewitness who is describing seeing Matthew on the side of his own building the night that Charlie went missing. Now, the only thing the cops couldn't figure out is why a grocer's child and how did he get $100,000? Maybe it has to do with his rich father, but that's inside information and it's a pretty heavily kept secret because his father is Herman Baggerly and that's something that even EB didn't know. So the way the cops have it figured out, Matthew got in some really bad gambling debt. So he orchestrated this kidnapping of his own child where Herman Baggerly would actually pay the $100,000 to get the child back. He then would use that money to pay off his debts, but the kidnapping went horribly wrong and it ended up in baby Charlie's death. So they arrest Matthew Dodson, and they make a complete scene of it outside of the police station. E.B. then calls a meeting with both Perry Mason and Herman Baggerly and wants to get his side of things. And his side of things are Herman hooked up with Matthew's mother outside of Missouri. And he wasn't even aware that Matthew existed until a couple years ago when he came into his life. He made Matthew swear that he would become a God-fearing man. And if he did so, he could move out to California and form a life. That included his own business. They had a sort of arrangement. But Herman Baggerly does not believe for a second that his child could be capable of such a horrible, heinous act. But Mason is not so sure. And he's also pissed off about the fact that Herman kept this from them. They never once heard that Matthew Dodson was his child. It was more of Matthew Dodson is just in the same church as me. And Herman shoots back, well, you guys kept your service record from me. I looked into you. I found out you were discharged and not the honorable type. You were blue note discharged. And that's usually held for either black people or gay people. And you don't look black to me. So which one is it? And if Mason was discharged, it might have to do with the fact that during a battle, he ended up shooting his own men, but it was out of compassion. They couldn't move and they were about to get gas, so he put them out of their misery. But Mason lives with this every day. He kind of has PTSD. So he doesn't take too kindly to this accusation by Herman Baggerly and wants to kick the shit out of him. But instead of doing that, he decides to leave and go follow up on the cop's eyewitness. Before he does that, though, he stops off at the Dodsons and questions Emily. Asks her if she's ever heard of this eyewitness before, her relationship with Matthew, the marriage, and if he could, in fact, be capable of such an act. And she denies everything. She has no idea who this witness is. She doesn't believe that Matthew could do this. And she's getting more and more irritated to the point where she finally says, Mr. Mason, if you want to keep questioning me like this, you can go out with the other reporters. But instead of doing so, he decides to go across the street and question her neighbor. Now, Emily's story has always been that she fell asleep by the radio and she's sticking to that. But the neighbor lets him know that Emily's really lonely. In her opinion, Matthew works too much. And you can tell that she's lonely because she's constantly on the phone. And that included the night that Charlie went missing. And Mason can't believe this because her story has always been that she fell asleep. But the neighbor says, no, look, she's on the phone right now. And sure enough, there's Emily in the window calling somebody. Now, that same day, the cops had mentioned that two stiffs were found in an abandoned building. And they were found by a cop named Officer Drake. Officer Drake was alerted to the dead bodies by a resident. And he followed the blood trail up into the roof. But that's where it stopped. When he looked down in the alley, the body of the guy who fell is gone. So he puts all of this in his police report, but detectives Holcomb and Ennis question it. They start picking it apart, asking, well, maybe it could have came from the roof down and not from the building up. And Drake respectively says, yeah, maybe, but the blood trail was in fact heading up. They start then mocking him about the fact that he'll never be a detective because he's black. And it forces him to have to change his report, even though he knows that that's the wrong thing to do. He doesn't really have a choice. The next day, Emily has to go casket shopping, but she's not in the right mind to do so. So she wants to go get food and ends up heading there with Della after getting accosted by a bunch of reporters outside of the funeral parlor. And she's not really touching her food because she's just in a very, very fragile state. At one point, she excuses herself and gets up to use the payphone. And as soon as she finishes up, who sneaks in there? Perry Mason, who is following her. But he's not that slick because Della saw him go into the phone booth. Before Della can question him, he is able to find out the number that she just called and calls up the person who handles his messages to reverse look up whose number that is and their address. He then gets chastised by Della for following him, but he says, look, I'm just doing my job. So with the address, Mason that night heads to this person's home. And what he finds is a dead body. And it's the dead body of the guy who jumped from rooftop to rooftop but missed and fell into the alleyway. Although it's made to look like he blew his brains out with a shotgun. He even left a suicide note saying, I can't 
live with what I've done and you can find the others at this address. And the address is obviously that abandoned building that Ennis shot up. Mason also notices that the guy had some fake teeth and that will come into play later. He snoops around the house some more and sees that the guy burned a bunch of money and then he sees a stuffed baby alligator. And when he flips it over, he sees a tag for an alligator farm. And this alligator farm just so happened to sell stuffed baby turtles as well. And one of those turtles happened to be in baby Charlie's room. And at the time, Mason didn't think anything of it, but this seems like too much of a coincidence. He also notices that in that alligator are love notes written from Emily to this guy. So as soon as he's done there, he takes the love notes and heads over to Emily Dotson's place to question her about it. He accuses her of the infidelity, and at first she denies it, but after he shows her the letters, she can't deny it anymore. He then tells her that he's dead, and that's when she really breaks down, because her baby's dead, her lover's dead, and her husband's arrested for the murder. The next day, Perry heads to E.B.'s office with the notes to show that they can get Matthew off. But Perry and Della are at odds. Perry thinks that this proves that Emily did it. And Della, having spent the day with her, doesn't think there's a chance in hell that she did it. Now, another guy in that meeting is Pete, who has been rehired by Perry, even though E.B. can't stand him. He thinks he's a degenerate, and even says as much. But Pete is really good at his job, and he's found two eyewitnesses that were in the gambling ring that also had Matthew Dodson in it the night that baby Charlie went missing, and they could be their alibi. Now, Mason's whole thing is we're here to defend Baggerly and his son, not his daughter-in-law. And while this might be embarrassing because his son was cheated on, it's going to get him off of murder. So the way that Mason has it figured out, it was Emily Dotson's lover who took baby Charlie that night. But Pete jumps in and says, wait, I thought you just said that Emily's lover was distracting her on the phone. How could he be in two places at once? And that's where Mason's story starts coming apart. E.B. says, you can't just pull this stuff out of your ass. It's not going to work. But E.B. is so hung up on these letters that he grabbed from the scene of the crime. And the problem is... It's going to be really tough to get them into evidence. And that's where EB's having trouble. How do I submit these? How did I even come about these? It's not like I can replant them at the scene. The scene is now crawling with cops because I had to call it in. EB then asked both Perry and Della, we got to look at what we got. Matthew is a gambler. Emily is a cheat. But do you think either of them did this? Della firmly says no. But Mason says, I don't know, not intentionally. EB then throws down the letters on the table and says the letters will stay here until I can figure out how to submit these into evidence. Now that day is also the same day as baby Charlie's funeral ceremony and they're going to hold it at the church. Although not everybody is thrilled about that. While doing the seating arrangements, because this event has some pretty heavy hitters at it, one of the members brought up that it might not be the best idea to hold this event at the temple. Because yes, while it's a tragedy of what happened to baby Charlie and he is part of the parish, you also have to look at it like one of the members of the parish is being charged for that murder. So do they want the unwanted attention but Herman Baggerly who was in that meeting stood up for his son saying there's no way he could have done it he's a god-fearing man just like you so the event goes on and people in attendance includes some cops the DA Perry EB Della and even Clark Gable makes an appearance and when sister Alice gets up there she gives an impassioned speech riling up the crowd saying that she hopes the cops give justice to whomever did this after the ceremony the group starts making their way over to the hearse as Emily is accompanied by sister Alice but then she is suddenly arrested by the police for the exact same crime that Matthew was arrested for this causes quite a big scene but in the middle of it detective Holcomb looks back at Perry and gives him a hat tip because Perry along with EB decided that it was best for their client to give the information to the police about Emily to try to get Matthew off so instead of heading in the hearse she's heading in the paddy wagon. Afterwards, E.B. and Perry head to this affluent kind of boys club that E.B. had met the district attorney in earlier in the episode, but Perry doesn't want to be there. He doesn't feel good about what he did, and the one thing that's sticking with him is what Della said. Infidelity is not murder. E.B. tries to make him feel better, saying that the charges against Emily are never going to stick anyway. I mean, she's a God-fearing housewife, so they were able to get their client off, and the charges against his wife aren't going to stick anyway, so it's a win-win for everybody. And E.B. is able to stick in the nose of the district attorney, whom he has a rivalry with even though they're completely two-faced to each other. The other thing that Mason is hung up on is the piece of thread that he pulled from baby Charlie. He's been carrying it around and kind of playing with the matchbox that he's kept it in. He asks EB, do you have any idea how many pieces of thread are in this town? But EB says, I'm sure you'll get to the bottom of it. And Perry knows because he headed to a place to try to find out where this thread came from, but he found out there's a ton of thread in the town. And it's not going to be easy at all to track down where this particular piece of thread came from. EB then leaves to go schmooze with a district attorney and some other people and Mason just leaves disgusted. Now, while Mason and EB were discussing the case, Officer Drake was patrolling his route, and with some downtime, he decided to head to the alleyway, where he's poking around, and he finds the remnants of false teeth, and they look an awful lot like the same false teeth that were in the guy's head who, quote, blew his brains out. 
In episode three, the media has gone to both EB and the district attorney to get their sides of the story. EB says that the district attorney has no case. He's charging Emily Dodson with the same thing that they charged Matthew Dodson with. They have no evidence, and he's going to get her off with it. He is very confident in his case. But the same goes for the district attorney. Armed with those letters that both EB and Perry handed in to get Matthew off, the district attorney paints the picture that Emily, along with her lover, George Gannon, had conspired to swindle Herman Baggerly out of a lot of his money, and they used baby Charlie to do so. Gannon had linked up with a couple of low-life gangsters to kidnap the child, but greed got the better of him, and he took them both out. He then felt so guilty that he committed suicide. So while they're not going to charge Emily with murder yet, they're literally charging her with the exact same thing that they charged Matthew Dodson with. Although, as he's leaving the court, the district attorney says that if they can prove at all that Emily Dodson sewed baby Charlie's eyes, then he will tack on murder to her charges. While he's standing out in the courtroom steps, he proclaims that he's going to get justice for baby Charlie. And across the street, Detective Ennis is watching this all go down. Now, while the district attorney and EB were having their pissing contest in the media, Perry wanted to get some answers from Sister Alice. So he heads to one of her sermons, and while looking around, he realized that this thing is a cash cow. I mean, during the Great Depression, people just can't wait to fork over money into the collection baskets. But this whole religious thing really isn't his scene, so he steps out in the hallway to kill time before he meets with Sister Alice, and he's looking at all the artifacts that they have on display about her life. He then gets the call to meet with her, and when he walks in the room, she's hooked up to an IV, which he finds really bizarre. He asks what's in the IV, and somebody tells him that it's vitamins and saline. Now, in this meeting, you have Sister Alice, but a bunch of the elders along with her mother. And they've met because he wants to investigate George Gannon, who worked at the church. Right away, the church says that they are horrified to find out what George Gannon did, and they didn't really associate him with him that much. But they bring anybody into their flock, and he was one of the people. He came with great references, which they hand over to Mason. And he tells them that Gannon did odds and ends of the church whenever they needed something. While Mason starts looking over what they gave him in terms of references for Gannon, Sister Alice makes mention that he should come to one of their sermons more often. But Perry Mason and religion do not go together. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff. And he tells her that God left him in France during the war. After this meeting, Mason goes over to the coroner's office and meets Pete Strickland there. He finds out that Gannon's body went to another morgue because apparently his house was like two or three blocks from the city lines. So because of that, he doesn't have his body, but he does have the body of the victims that were found in that abandoned building. And as Mason is taking pictures of the one person's body, when they flip him over, he notices a lot of bruising on the neck. And he asks about it, and the coroner tells him that his best guess is that this guy was shot, but he was laying on the ground and he wasn't dead yet. And Gannon, to expedite the process, put his foot on his throat to suffocate him. After they leave the coroner's office, they go to grab lunch, and Mason can't figure this whole thing out. Because the story that's being put out there is Gannon walked into this building and shot a bunch of guys up. But the one guy apparently wasn't dead, so instead, he decides to put his foot on his throat. Then he drives home, and he's overridden with guilt, so he commits suicide. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to him. But as he's trying to figure it out, he hands over the references to Pete and says, go look into these, maybe we can get a lead there. I'm going to head to the police station to try to find what items they found on the dead bodies. But when Mason gets to the police station, he's told that they don't have the personal effects. They were bagged up by Holcomb and Ennis, and even if they did have them, they wouldn't give them to Mason anyway. But they are willing to give him the police report. And that police report is basically one paragraph. It is pathetic. So Mason has to talk to the cop, Officer Drake, who wrote the report. But he's on the beat at the moment. He does try to sweet talk one of the secretaries at the police station to give him some information, and it's kind of unclear if he gets any. But Mason then has to head over to the courthouse, where Emily Dotson has to put in a plea. And she has had quite a morning. It started in her cell where EB was coaching her on what to do and what to say and how important it is that both her and Matthew look like a unified front even though there was infidelity. But all Matthew can think about is that infidelity. He wants to know where her and George had sex and he keeps pressing the issue. Eventually gets to the point where he lashes out at her saying that this is all her fault because she knew about this guy the entire time and said nothing. And even after he was arrested, Emily said nothing. And because of that, they had to bury their baby alone. Neither of them were there and that's her fault. She's just as guilty for baby Charlie dying as anybody. But even after that big blow up, Matthew does as he's told. He holds her hand in the courtroom, photogs flash a bunch of pictures, and it looks like they are in solidarity. But EB, on the other hand, is having issues. He seems visibly flustered, as if this is his first case. And it's worth mentioning that this is a massive case for him. But he seems just way too eager to point out that his client is innocent. And he gets blindsided when the judge is asking for a plea and Emily mumbles the word guilty. And this causes a big stir in the courtroom with one woman having to be escorted out because everybody heard her say guilty. E.B. pleads with the judge that she meant not guilty and the judge gives her one more opportunity to hand in the not guilty plea and she says not guilty. It then comes time to set bail and bail gets set at $25,000, which is a ton of money. So it was a really bad day for E.B. Jonathan. When Mason is leaving the courtroom, 
he gets yelled at by Della, who says that he didn't have to hand in that evidence. He sat on evidence before, and he knew what would happen. Yeah, okay, it would get Matthew off, but it put Emily behind bars, and they all know that Emily didn't do this. And now because of what they did, they've got Emily sitting in jail feeling guilty because everybody thinks that she did it. Mason tries to plead his case, but she doesn't want to hear it. She says to him, don't you have some windows to go peek in, and then leaves. But he doesn't have windows to go peek in. He has a cop to chase down, and he's able to do so. He finds Officer Drake on the beat, but Drake won't tell him anything. Basically telling him to piss off, go read the police report. And it's a good thing that Drake didn't tell him anything, because unbeknownst to both of them, Ennis was watching him from afar. And later that night at the market when... Drake is shopping with his wife, and Ennis approaches both of them and asks Drake if he's been approached by a private investigator, and Drake says, yeah, but I didn't tell him anything. He says, good, don't. Don't talk to him. And then Ennis kind of threatens him and his wife and their unborn baby. Ennis asks how far along is Drake's wife, and then touches her stomach. Now, on the surface, none of that seems like a big deal, but it's the way he did it. It's definitely taken as a threat. You talk, and something could happen to your child or your wife. Now, Mason, on the other hand, after getting nothing from Drake, went to go meet Pete, who has found out some information on those references. And it's that George Gannon was working in the count room at the Lucky Lagoon Casino, and that's something that he kept from the church. Mason tells Pete good work and says, I need the rest of Duke's police reports. So now Mason has a new lead, and he wants to head to the Lucky Lagoon Casino, and he brings that pilot slash friends with benefits, but it seems like she wants more than that. She wants a whole do-over from the New Year's Eve fiasco, but she doesn't know that he's actually heading there to work. She thinks he's heading there to spend the night with her. And Mason gets caught asking one of the bartenders if he knew George Gannon, and he didn't, and says, you gotta talk to Al, the boss. So the bartender is able to set up a meeting between Al and Perry, and Al tells him, I didn't really know the guy, to be honest with you. He was a bookskeeper, he was an accountant, and he was quiet. And while that's everything you want in a guy working in the count room, he came in here talking about how this was unholy, and we're all gonna go to hell, and the good book. So I wrote him a great reference just to kind of get rid of him. So with not much information, Mason leaves the room and finds that Lupe the pilot has one big, and they celebrate by making out in a fountain. The next day, Ennis goes to a rub and tug to collect the money that they're extorting from the place for, quote, police protection. And he tells the madam, yeah, it's a little light. But she points to the newspaper about the trial and says Mr. Wu-Sang is not happy because cops were asking about him at the Lucky Lagoon Casino. And Ennis says, what cops? And she says, some guy named Mason. Now, Mason, meanwhile, armed with the police reports for Drake, and upon reading them over, he realized that the one about the murders is an anomaly because Drake is very thorough in his reports, except that one. It was one paragraph. So he approaches Drake about it, saying, you've been silenced, and I know you've been silenced because of how thorough your work is. But Drake punches him. Mason gets up and keeps egging Drake on, trying to get information out of him, but Drake punches him again and says, I'll tell you right now, I could kill you here and no one would bat an eye. So leave me alone. So while Mason leaves Drake alone, he knows that he's being silenced and heads to E.B. Jonathan's office to let him know that there is a cop who knows something and he's just got to get it out of him. But E.B. is visibly stressed out. He's having trouble focusing, trying to get Emily bailed out, but 25 grand is a lot and Herman Baggerly is blowing him off. And he ends up snapping at Perry just saying that this case is pretty simple. No one cares about a random beat cop's police report. Mason can tell that his friend isn't acting himself and asks if he's all right, but in fact he's not. He woke up that morning with blood in the sink. He's also tending to forget things and having to be reminded about what he was talking about. And he's definitely got some kind of health issue. While Mason is sitting in his office trying to explain how this Drake thing is real and how he knows something, they get word from Herman Baggerly that he's pulling all funding. And while they're not fired, they're simply not getting paid at the moment, which is just as bad as being fired. And this comes as a huge blow to everybody in the room. So EB needs to find the money somehow to bail Emily out because, as he says, What attorney would I be if I can't even bail out my own client? And he heads to a former acquaintance that he had business with to try to see if he'll lend him the money, but he won't. Because EB burned him in the past and almost got him disbarred. He's really only taking this meeting as a courtesy. And he tells EB to find her a plea deal, but EB says, I can't do that, she's innocent, and I know I can get her off. The man then changed the subject, saying that the district attorney called and was asking about their old partnership. And this guy told him that it wasn't in his interest to discuss the past, but he warns Jonathan that if the district attorney digs, there's going to be something there. EB tries to get the conversation back to the Dotson case and wants him to put in a call to the judge to try to get a bail reduction, but the guy says, you're not listening. Just take a plea deal and keep me out of this. Don't call me again. And Jonathan is just out of options. And while EB was trying to get Emily bailed out, her husband was meeting with his father, Herman Baggerly, and he's trying to figure out why Emily cheated on him. And Herman says that the Baggerly men have a weakness for loose women, taking a shot at his mother, which Matthew takes exception to, and Herman says, you're right, I apologize. That's very unholy of me. Let me show you something. And then he pulls out the blueprints for this town that's about 30 miles outside of Los Angeles that he wants Matthew to help him build. 
an entire community dedicated to the church. That same night, Della headed to the police station to get Emily to sign a new retainer agreement, but she gets told that she can't see Emily at the moment because visiting hours are over, and that's kind of weird to her. Then she notices that the woman that's sitting in the police station was the same woman who was assigned to Emily to make sure that she wasn't attacked because a lot of people want to take out a woman that killed a baby. So she starts calling for heads, saying that that was a court order and she can get everybody fired, and she demands to see Emily. She's able to get past a few of the guards and opens a door and finds that Emily is being harassed and interrogated by both Holcomb and Ennis. And she asks Ennis, are you seriously trying to slap a confession out of her? And Ennis plays it off like she was suicidal and she was about to harm herself and they had to put her in this room. But it doesn't seem like that's what Della walked in on. And she tells Emily it'll be all right and then says that everybody in the room is in deep shit for what they've done to her. Now let's move back over to Mason who is leaving a bar where he met Pete. And they were drowning their sorrows about, quote, being fired. When he walks to his car and he finds Officer Drake waiting for him. Because Drake has had a change of heart and is willing to talk to Mason. He lets him know that the police report was doctored. While it says the blood in the police report was leading from the roof to the room, it was the opposite. It was leading up to the roof. And when he went down to the alleyway, he found a pair of messed up dentures. He hands them to Perry, and Perry remembers what the guy Al said in the Lucky Lagoon Casino about how George was always flapping around his crappy dentures. And he also remembers seeing a half pair of dentures in George's blown-off head when he found his body. So he grabs Pete, hops in the car, and rushes over to the morgue, praying to God that they haven't cremated the body yet. And they break in to find out that they haven't, which is great news. Because now they're able to see if the dentures match up. And sure enough, they do. Which proves that this guy died in that alleyway. He didn't blow his head off. So the question now is, who killed him? And while Mason was figuring out that George was murdered, Sister Alice is going through this whole dog and pony show about this miracle thing. And this is right after getting yelled at by her mother for going to visit Emily Dodson, saying that they don't need the negative publicity. But Sister Alice believes that Emily is truly innocent. And she kind of seems like she's a puppet for her mother. But during the ceremony, she starts hearing voices and then collapse and starts convulsing having seizures. And the media surrounds this boat that she's in, taking pictures of her, but when she comes to, she says, don't worry about baby Charlie, mom. God told me that I'm to resurrect him. And the media heard all of that. It was cool. In episode four, you find out that Sister Alice had an epileptic seizure, and she's going to need several weeks to recuperate. The doctor tells her that she's got to slow down on her workload because that's what caused the seizure. Her mom assures the elders that she's had these seizures before, and she's come back stronger each time, but in her absence, She'll handle the sermons. And Elder Brown says, actually, no, you won't. Because the elders aren't really happy with Sister Alice or her mom, Bertie, at the moment. The claim that Sister Alice is going to bring Charlie Dodson back from the dead has made the papers and made a lot of waves. And Elder Brown, along with the rest of the elders, want her to make a statement renouncing what she said. Because what she said is threatening the financial stability of the church. Herman Baggerly speaks up that he lost $100,000 in the chimney of George Gannon, and to make things worse, Sister Alice is going and speaking with and praying with the woman who helped conspire to kill Charlie Dodson. It's not a good look. Bertie tries to remind them that Sister Alice receiving messages from God is really the bedrock of the church, but Elder Brown takes exception to this, and even though Bertie puts up a fight, it's pretty much decided that Sister Alice will have to walk back the comments. And their sentiments are kind of felt throughout the church. Church. Now, half the people love what she said and are supporting Sister Alice, but the other half are denouncing her as a heretic, to the point where when a family showed up to give her, quote, baked goods, the baked goods weren't brownies and cupcakes, it was a snake, as they cursed her. So there's a lot of people upset that she's claiming to raise the dead. So this is really an attempt for the church to save face and more so save their pockets. Now, even though Bertie doesn't agree with the decision, she goes to talk to Sister Alice and says, half the people out there want to kiss your feet, but half the people want to kill you. And Elder Brown is one of those people as he's licking his chops right now. You had an episode. You misspoke. But Sister Alice says, I didn't misspeak. I heard what I heard. Did I miss here in Oklahoma? I mean, he speaks and we do. You said that. I mean, you think I want this? You think I want God in my head? I don't, but he's there. But Bertie says, okay, well, if he's there next time, tell him that what he's claiming that you're going to do cannot be done. And when Sister Alice is able to regain her strength, she goes out and addresses the crowd with a speech that was written for her by the elders, but she's not into it. I mean, you can barely hear her. It's clear she's kind of going through the motions. So she goes to address the crowd closer so they can hear her, and someone comes forward. Now, initially, she thinks that this guy's going to attack her, but instead, he gives her a blanket and says, this is for baby Charlie when you bring him back. And that's when Sister Alice throws the entire script out and announces that on Easter Sunday, baby Charlie will rise again, and Emily Dobson is innocent. She's quickly whisked away by Bertie and some of the elders as Elder Brown, who is shocked by this revelation, just starts screaming blasphemy. And the crowd is going nuts. 
Now, Perry has gotten together with both Pete and the coroner and invited him over to Perry's house to, quote, hang out, have fun. But they weren't actually looking to hang out with the coroner. They had stolen George Gannon's body and have been keeping it in Mason's basement. And they want the coroner to do an autopsy. And when the coroner sees it, he is completely disgusted at what they did, saying that he can't just give him an autopsy in this makeshift basement. And this isn't what he signed up for at all. He thought that they wanted to hang out. But no, they just wanted to use him. So with him refusing to do so, they had to take matters into their own hands and dump the body at a golf course in the coroner's jurisdiction, making sure that when that body is picked up as a John Doe, it will be taken to the coroner's office and not somebody else. That way they can get a second autopsy report and prove that George Gannon didn't blow his brains out. He was murdered well before then. So Perry feels like this is a win-win, and he heads over to EB's office where the day before EB had met with the district attorney and the judge about moving Emily Dotson to a secure location because of what happened with Detective Holcomb and Detective Ennis. And while the judge agrees to do that, he doesn't lower the bail. He also learns in this meeting that Matthew Dodson is now working with the prosecution and is going to denounce his wife. And after that meeting, EB heads to the bank to try to get a loan to bail Emily out, but he's rejected. It's a really bad day for him, and he's stressed out. So Perry's excitement over dumping the body isn't matched by EB. But Perry continues with the theory that they know that there was a fourth guy in this. They just don't know who it is yet. Unfortunately for them, though, Detective Drake is not going to testify. And EB, who has been half listening at this point, says, okay, one more time, lay it out for me. And Perry lays it out as simple as he can that George Gannon did not kill himself. There was a fourth man, yada, yada, yada. And EB takes that to the district attorney trying to get Emily's charges dropped. He tries to strong arm the district attorney saying that he could go to the press about this, but he feels like he should give him the courtesy of being able to drop the charges on his own. He does admit that while they don't know who the fourth guy is yet, they're going to find out pretty soon. The district attorney, who's playing it pretty cool, says, are you enjoying this? And EB says, yeah, I am. And then the district attorney pulls out a a bunch of envelopes and asks his connection with all of these people. And it's the one thing they all have in common where they were clients of EB Jonathan. And it turns out that EB was robbing Peter to pay Paul. And Peter in this situation was his clients and Paul was his debt. EB makes the case that everybody did that because the economy went to shit. But that is something that could get you disbarred. So the district attorney says you have three options. You can take this to trial. You can plead out or you can get disbarred and he gives him until Friday to make the decision but while the district attorney acts really tough in the meeting and plays it off like he's not worried he is and he finds detective Holcomb and Ennis and demands to know why they haven't been able to get a confession out of Emily Dotson they've had three days and as both of them start making excuses he demands to know who actually killed baby Charlie because EB saying that his guy is claiming that there's a fourth person involved now both Ennis and Holcomb brush that off as Perry Mason come on he's a loser nobody's gonna hire him He doesn't know what he's talking about. Ennis tells him that there is no fourth man and the case they have is tight, but the district attorney says, you better pray to God that Mason isn't playing this better than you guys are, and then leaves. And Mason has had quite a day after leaving EB's office. He calls his son to make sure he got the Christmas present that he bought for him, which unfortunately the kid didn't really want. When the Hollywood star that Mason was taking pictures of during his infidelity ends up seeing him on the street and roughing him up a little bit. That night, he hooks up with Lupe, who tells him that you're obsessed with this case. I can see it in you. And in fact, Mason is. In the middle of the night, he gets up and he goes and looks at the board that he has of all the evidence laid out, and he remembers something that Matthew Dodson said during the first initial interview with the police. So first thing in the morning, he heads over to EB's office where EB slept there that night. He had a huge fight with Della, who went home, vented to her girlfriend, and said, I'm not going in tomorrow. He's on his own. And it really all stemmed from the fact that E.B. Jonathan does not appreciate what he has in Della. And she got sick of it. To defend him a little bit, he's just very, very stressed out. So when Perry shows up in the morning, E.B.'s in rough shape. The phone is ringing off the hook, and it's people from the district attorney's office, but E.B. is telling Mason just to hang it up. Mason starts looking for the file from that initial interview with Matthew Dodson, but you can just tell that E.B. is kind of out of it, not really paying attention. Seems very depressed. Perry doesn't think much of it and grabs what he needs and goes. Hooks up with Pete and heads to the location of where they found baby Charlie. And he's able to locate where the kidnappers were held up. They were held up across the street where they could see the Dodsons on the phone. So Perry has been able to recreate pretty much what happened. Guys were on the phone they saw the Dodsons the Dodsons want a proof of baby Charlie so somebody went on the trolley and placed the baby there Dodsons head downstairs to get baby Charlie the guy from the trolley ends up hopping in the car racing up the street clipping the trolley and then there was a fourth guy who had to grab the money because they weren't willing to go across the street and risk getting caught by the cops it's too far and at that point the cops had already shown up the question is though where did they go well they weren't going to go out the front door past all the commotion so they must have gone out the back But when Perry and Pete go out the back, thanks to one of the janitors, there's really nowhere to go. 
Although they look up and they see a walkway. And the janitor tells them that the walkway goes to the Elks Lodge. And I guess if you really wanted to, you could escape that way. So they head up there and act like they're going to become members, where there just so happens to be an assembly going on for some crippled children who are looking to go to summer camp. And in the audience is Ennis, because Ennis's daughter is one of those little girls that's on stage. And Perry approaches him, basically telling him that he knows he's involved somehow, but Ennis plays it off like, buddy, this is my normal hangout. I'm here about three days a week. You're grasping at straws here. You have nothing. Although Mason doesn't think so. Now, while Perry was figuring this all out, E.B. went to go visit Emily and apologizes and says that he's not going to be able to bail her out. She lied to the police, they put a big money on her bail, and while he wants to get her out, he's just not able to. And he thinks the best idea for her right now is to plea out. The max time she would do is 20 years, and there's a nice women's facility up in Chino. But she can't believe that he's advising her to admit that she's guilty to something that she did not do. She's able to get E.B. to come around on that, saying that she's going to fight, and E.B. agrees, yeah, you should fight. But when he heads home, he has no plans on fighting. He's given up. The chickens have finally come home to roost. He's broke, about to be disbarred, is working pro bono, and decides, you know what? It's not worth it. He closes all the windows in his house, puts on the gas stove, opens it up in an attempt to commit suicide. In episode 5, Della goes to pick up E.B. Jonathan in the morning, but there's no answer at the door, so she lets herself in, and that's when she finds E.B. Jonathan's dead body. She's shocked and horrified and ends up calling the police as well as Perry Mason. And both her and Perry head up to San Francisco to deliver E.B.'s body to his family. But upon arrival, they realize that E.B.'s family didn't really like him too much. In fact, his son says he didn't really have a relationship with him, and he's not even heartbroken about his father's death. And that night, both E.B. and Della end up getting drunk at the hotel, talking about how they met E.B., and how he was a great guy, but apparently he was a deadbeat dad. Della tells a story about how she first met E.B. after leaving her cushy lifestyle where she had a prearranged fiancé, a trust fund, an inheritance. She left all of that behind to go move to Los Angeles where she answered an ad in one of the newspapers for a secretary. And the rest is history. The next morning, Della waits in the lobby of the hotel for Perry, but Perry's already checked out. And he hitchhikes, along with a bunch of other migrant workers, to his ex-wife's house. Because after what happened with E.B., he feels like he should spend time with his own child. He doesn't want to be a deadbeat dad just like E.B. was. And more importantly, he doesn't want his child to despise him like E.B.'s child did. But when he knocks on the door, his ex-wife isn't exactly thrilled to see him because this was an unplanned visit. She does, however, let Perry spend time with Teddy, and you can tell that Teddy is really excited to see Perry. Later that day, Perry starts fishing for an invite to dinner asking where her new husband is, but she squashes that idea pretty quickly, saying, you're not staying for dinner. You can't just do this. You can't just pop in and out of his life. You're supposed to spend child support checks, and you don't even do that. They get into a little bit of a tiff, but eventually the new husband does show up, and he has a really good relationship with Perry. He likes him. And he actually invites Perry to stay for dinner but Perry says no I can't I have to get back to Los Angeles now back in Los Angeles sister Alice is with a couple of the elders and her mom counting up the donations for that week and sister Alice wants $25,000 to get Emily Dodson freed but Bertie doesn't think it's a good idea the optics aren't great and sister Alice starts counting up some of the donations look there's two dollars here there's five dollars here but Bertie trying to make her point starts reading a death threat making the case that Sister Alice isn't as loved as she's seen, and her proclamation that she's going to bring back baby Charlie from the dead has ruffled a lot of feathers, including Elder Brown, who has left the church and is leading a revolt against Sister Alice, standing outside of her sermons every day with a big billboard on a truck that says how many days there are until Easter, aka how many days until Sister Alice has proved to be a fraud, denouncing her and stating that he won't go back in the temple until she is gone and the heretic is cast out. So yes, while there are a lot of people on her side, there are also a lot of people against her. Sister Alice makes the case that they're bringing in that money now anyway without her on the microphone. And she wants to do something called the divine healing, which is something they used to do back in Oklahoma. And that's where she wants to go back to, her roots. She wants to get back to what they were doing before they got to Los Angeles. And this divine healing could be it. Her case is, as soon as I get back on the microphone, those donations are going to roll in. She looks at Bertie and says, so give me $25,000 or you're going to be relieved from your post. And this is the first time she's actually standing up for herself and not being a puppet for her mother. So Bertie does as her daughter wishes and bails out Emily Dodson. And because she's the one to do it, she's tasked with the burden of the responsibility. If Emily leaves the house, leaves the state, basically breaks the bail agreement, Bertie's going to be the one to have to answer for it. And Sister Alice has done a really good job of making it homey for Emily when she arrives there. Later that day, Della, who is back from San Francisco, finds out that Emily has been bailed out and heads over to Sister Alice's house, where Bertie tells her that she has a new court-appointed lawyer. But when she sees who the court-appointed lawyer is, she knows that Emily's in trouble because the guy is just 
He's, he's a boob. It's the best way I can describe him. And Della knows that Emily is in trouble and she needs a new lawyer. So she heads over to Lyle, the guy that E.B. Jonathan asked for help in bailing out Emily Dodson, the same guy who denied E.B. Jonathan's help and said, don't contact me again about this. But upon E.B.'s death, you're more inclined times, and plus, he likes Della. And she's headed over to his office under the mask of getting E.B.'s will probated, but... In reality, she's looking for his guidance and help. She's created a list of a bunch of different lawyers that could be good for the Emily Dodson case and wants his opinion on them. And he says, well, this guy would do it for a big check and the notoriety, and this guy over here would do it just for the notoriety. But in all honesty, she doesn't want any of them. She wants Lyle. And when she brings that up to him, he says, I'm sorry, but this is a losing case, and I can't risk my reputation on it. And he turns her down. Now, while Perry was away taking care of E.B.'s remains, Pete Strickland was still working the case. He linked up with one of the detectives that he knows and wants to know more about Detective Ennis. And the detective tells Pete that the Dodson case was supposed to be his until Ennis swooped in and kind of paid off their boss to get in front of the line and take it. Now, Pete's been following Ennis around for a while, trying to catch him in something, but to really no avail. And on one of those stakeouts where Ennis is shaking down that brothel, he ends up getting caught by Ennis. So Ennis invites him into the brothel to talk, where he basically puts all of the blame on Detective Holcomb, saying out he doesn't want to shake down the brothels, but he has to. And he wants to get to the bottom of this Dotson case, because if he does, he'll be able to get out from under Holcomb's thumb. And while he realizes that Perry Mason is doing a job, he's looking in all the wrong places. There is no fourth guy, and Ennis isn't even involved. And if you're looking at a detective, you better look at Holcomb. He gets up to leave, but then... Brings over one of the girls, gives it to Pete, and says, here, she's on me. So later that night, Pete meets up with Perry and says, yeah, he told me all this, but the thing is, there's too many coincidences. Like, every time there's a new detail in this case, Ennis is the first one there. Even when it's out of his jurisdiction, like the George Gannon situation, where Ennis was the first detective to show up. How did he know? It's too fishy of a situation. And even though Pete knows that Perry can't pay him, He's willing to do it for free because he's so insulted by the fact that Ennis tried to pay him off with a prostitute. The next day, Sister Alice has her divine healing and she's riling up the crowd as she brings up this frail-looking guy who's bound to a chair. And as she continues on with her sermon, she's whispering in his ear every once in a while, you don't need the chair. Get up. You're fine. And eventually, he's motivated enough by her words to actually stand up. And he even starts walking towards her with the help of the crowd a little bit. But when he stands up, the crowd goes nuts. And Sister Alice is going crazy on stage with excitement, along with just about everybody else in the crowd, except for one person, Bertie, who just doesn't really seem amused by this. After the ceremony, Sister Alice sneaks Emily Dodson over to Charlie's gravesite. And this is breaking the bail agreement, but she doesn't even care. And Emily, who is seeing Charlie's grave for the first time, is so overcome with grief that she drops to her knees and starts crying in the dirt. And after a little bit, she finally raises her head and asks Sister Alice, when you raise baby Charlie from the dead, are you going to have to dig up the grave? But Sister Alice doesn't say anything. Now, while Sister Alice was healing the crippled, Della was over at E.B. Jonathan's office because it's paid for until the end of the month. And the new court-appointed lawyer is working on the case, but Della is working on getting a new lawyer. He calls her in and asks, what is all this stuff? It's barely any information on the case, and it's Perry Mason's chicken scratch. And Della plays dumb, but in reality, she hid all the pertinent evidence in her own place because she doesn't want this guy to have it. She doesn't think he's qualified and actually thinks he's a mole for the district attorney. And those suspicions are confirmed when he asks to use the phone and tells the operator, district attorney's office, please. So she picks up the other line and hears the conversation between this lawyer and the district attorney and confirms that, yeah, in fact, he's instructed to basically give all the information about the case over to the DA so that Emily Dodson can be railroaded in this matter. And she's not the only one who doesn't like this court-appointed lawyer because when Perry Mason finds out who it is, he heads over to E.B. Jonathan's old office in a frenzy. He tells him to get up out of E.B.'s chair because a respected man used to sit there and kind of roughs him up a little bit using a book of all things. But he scares him enough to flee the office. He then heads over to Della's place, pretty liquored up, where he just starts ranting and raving about this case saying how the district attorney doesn't have one. He's going to continue to remind the all-white, all-Christian jury that he's appointed that Emily Dodson is an adulterer. And he's going to flash up pictures of baby Charlie's dead body over and over again because he knows he doesn't have a case. And that's when it dawns on Della that she is staring at Emily Dodson's lawyer. 
So she grabs a typewriter and types up a fake note from EB's office claiming that Perry Mason was under an apprenticeship at EB's office for the last two years. And she forges EB's signature on it. And the next morning, the two head over to Sister Alice's place and meet with Sister Alice, Bertie, and Emily. And they make the case that Perry Mason should be Emily's lawyer because he knows the case better than anybody. There's only one problem. Perry isn't a lawyer. But not to worry, Della's pretty much thought of everything. The bar exam is in two weeks, and he can pass it, and then he's good to go. Sister Alice says, we don't really know if you're the right guy for this, but Perry says, unfortunately, I'm your only option. Nobody else wants the case. And after a little bit more convincing, Emily Dotson comes around and says, yes, I want you to be my lawyer. But then there's the old issue of the bar exam. It's not exactly easy to pass. Once again, though, Della has thought of everything. And she's brought in the assistant district attorney, who is gunning for the district attorney's job, to help out with this matter. He tells Perry that, the bar exam hasn't changed in 22 years, and he gives them all of the answers. And two weeks later, Perry Mason ends up passing the bar exam and getting sworn in as a lawyer. In episode six, it is the first day of the Dodson trial, and the prosecution gets up there and makes their opening statement, and it's a long one. But when Perry gets up there to make his opening statement, he freezes up, completely bombing it. That night, Pete, Perry, and Della get together at Perry's home slash office, and Perry mentions how... He's got this whole script laid out, and when they practice it, he's fine, but when he gets up there, he just bombs. Della mentions how there's so much stuff that the prosecution is mentioning that's just not true, and if they look into it more, they can prove it. And they're going to send Pete out to investigate some of this stuff, while also tasking Pete with trying to find a connection between Ennis and the kidnappers. Day two of the trial, Perry does way better. Matthew Dodson is on the stand, and the prosecution tries to paint Emily as an adulterer who conspired to kidnap her own child. When Perry cross-examines, he paints Matthew Dodson as a liar lying to Emily about why they were moving out to California, lying to the cops about where he was that night. And his cross-examination gets Matthew Dodson so upset that he comes unraveled on the stand, questioning if he's even the father of baby Charlie, and then yelling at Emily that he hopes that she dies. Day three, though, the prosecution calls this witness to the stand that Perry knew nothing about. Even though he objects to it, the judge allows it. And Perry turns to Emily and says, do you even know this guy? And she says, no, I don't think so. But the witness is a hotel manager that remembers Emily Dodson and George Gannon checking in and getting two adjoining rooms. And when he walked by it, he heard Emily and George having sex, but in the next room, he heard a baby crying. And when he went in, baby Charlie was just sitting on the bed, bawling his eyes out. And it's not a great picture of Emily. And when Perry visits Emily that night, he rips into her. Because all she said was that it was love letters and a few kisses here and there. Nothing like this. And that story makes her look terrible to everybody in the courtroom. Because the way they see it, if she was willing to leave baby Charlie on that bed while George and her had sex, then maybe she was willing to let George kidnap her own child. He yells at her, that's why you have to give me all the information so I'm adequately prepared. As he's leaving, he runs into Sister Alice and the two have a quick chat, but Perry lets her know, don't come to court. I know you think you're helping, you're not. So Perry's had a pretty rough day and he heads back to his home slash office where he sees Pete and Della going through a ton of boxes and he asks, what the hell is this? And Della says, well, when you accuse the district attorney of not handing over all the evidence, they sent all of the evidence and they put a ton of red herrings in a bunch of boxes. So they have to sift through all of it to try to find out what's pertinent to the case. They did, however, get a very small tip about one of the kidnappers being rented a room during the same period that Ennis lived in Denver. But that tip isn't enough to change Perry's mood so he walks outside to get some air when Pete follows him because Pete headed over to George Gannon's house after the prosecution mentioned this phantom garage that doesn't exist but then he saw George Gannon's mail that had just been delivered and something piqued his interest and he hands him two uncashed checks from the church made out to some company that just so happened to be addressed to George Gannon's residence and he's pretty sure that George was stealing from the church but the checks are signed by Elder Seidel so they are legit. He then gives Mason some advice because Officer Drake is said to take the stand the next day. So Pete tells him, use the dentures, screw the cop. You have a duty to your client to get her off and you know that that can help. But this leaves Mason with a moral conundrum. Does he use the teeth and break his promise to Drake or does he not use the teeth and hurt his client's chances in the process? So the prosecution calls Officer Drake and they question him and then Perry gets up and he decides to not use the dentures, trying to tiptoe around it by having Officer Drake look at the crime scene photos and point out the trail of blood, which there isn't. And he's claiming that it's 40 feet of blood, but you don't see it anywhere. Perry then asks him who was the first arriving detective and it was Detective Ennis. He asks him, do you think it's weird that Detective Ennis was the first one at that crime scene, the trolley car, and he was also the first one at George Gannon's suicide? But the DA objects and the judge sustains. 
So Mason switches gears and asks, did you recover any pertinent evidence at the scene of the crime? And Drake says no. And Mason does look down at the dentures, but decides once again not to use them and asks no further questions. Now, after court, he heads over to the church to look over their books. And when Elder Seidel walks in, he wants to know what the hell they're doing. And, and both Perry and Della claim that they had permission to do this, but Seidel says, you don't have permission. Mason tells him to relax because they're actually trying to help the church in this situation. They're trying to prove that George Gannon was stealing from the church. They then ask him what this company was that just happened to be addressed to George Gannon's residence, and Seidel says, well, it's probably a subsidiary. We wouldn't be able to survive as a church if we were just going by donations, so we have a couple of companies. But Della says it's more like 50 to 60 companies. As Mason continues to question Seidel about some of the deeds, one of them being this account with the initials JH, Della steals one of the accounting ledgers, and after Seidel doesn't give him much information, the two end up leaving. Now that night, the district attorney, along with Detective Holcomb, gets a Detective Ennis and start going through pre-trial testimony trying to coach him on his answers. But it kind of turns into them questioning Ennis more than coaching him, asking about the blood trail and the fact that he paid to be bumped up to be lead detective on the case. But Detective Ennis is having trouble answering the questions. And Holcomb says, if you're having trouble answering these simple questions, then Mason is going to tear you apart on the stand. Ennis reassures him that he can handle whatever Mason's bringing him, but he's more concerned with the fact that is he actually there to practice or is he there to be questioned by the district attorney and his partner? Either way, he does horrible in this practice and the district attorney decides not to put him on the stand. That same night, Sister Alice approaches Bertie with a signed letter from Emily Dotson saying that they can dig up baby Charlie's body. We're only a couple days out from Easter Sunday and the clock is ticking on this whole bringing baby Charlie back from the dead thing. Bertie tells her, you know she doesn't actually want you to do that. She's just placating you, right? She then tells Sister Alice how she's made other arrangements and then shows her a bunch of soup cases. And Sister Alice doesn't want to run, saying that if we can't do it, we can't do it, but I'm not going to run from it. Bertie lets her know that it's not just Elder Brown with his sign outside that want her to fail. There's a lot of people in the church that want her to fail. And because of that, they need to get the hell out of town now before they're embarrassed. But Sister Alice reminds Bertie that that church is hers. The success of the church is because of her, and she's not going anywhere. So if you want to run, go ahead but i'm staying right here and finally the last story of that night is when detective drake goes to visit perry at his office and thanks him for not going back on his word but it gave him a lot of time to think he tells mason how his boss actually gave him a bonus for not really giving any information on the stand and he's sick of it he's sick of having to be a second class citizen to white people and how a white murderer can look down on him just because he's black he wants to do the right thing and he wants to help emily dodson so he takes the dentures and puts it into an evidence box and even though it's not completely legal, he tells Mason, half the time people don't even look in these boxes anyway. And he wasn't kidding about his plan to actually help Emily. He knows the blowback that he can get to the point where he actually sends his pregnant wife to go live with her aunt for the time being, just to be on the safe side. So the next day when the prosecution calls the coroner to testify, the coroner is talking about how baby Charlie was suffocated to death, how his eyes were sewn open after the fact, and they start passing around pictures of baby Charlie's dead body to the jurors, and they are looking very dismissively at Emily Dodson. Perry then gets up and asks the coroner to look at this piece of evidence, i.e. the dentures, but the district attorney claims he has no idea what he's talking about. He's unaware of it. The issue for the district attorney is Perry's claiming to get it from the box that the district attorney's office sent over to him. So the piece of evidence has to be allowed. And Perry asked the district attorney, do you recognize that is that from George Gannon's second autopsy with you and this is the first time that the district attorney's hearing of this as well as the judge so they pull a sidebar but Perry is speaking so loudly saying how he knows that George Gannon was murdered Emily Dodson couldn't have done it that the judge gets pissed off and calls both of them into his chambers he tells Perry that he's not going to allow a second autopsy after the body of George Gannon went missing from the original morgue and he's not going to allow any conspiracy theories on the dentures they're inadmissible and even though Perry thinks this is complete bullshit he unfortunately can't do anything about it. So he goes out in the hallway and waits for the trial to resume when Della comes up to him because she's had quite a busy day. She was looking through some of the subsidiaries of the church and she found an interesting one called Gerard Incorporated whose CEO is Herman Baggerly and it was signed off on by John Hicks, a.k.a. J.H. And Hicks had signed off on a lot of these companies, which is one of the reasons they want to talk to him. And luckily, Della found out where he lived after he was able to procure 20 acres of land for a dollar, which is one hell of a deal for an accountant. But Perry can't go investigate at the moment because he gets called back into court where the prosecution calls their final witness. It's that woman who was hired to look after Emily in jail. And the prosecution asks about the time that Sister Alice came to visit her and what the two discussed. And the woman testifies to the fact that Emily said, how baby Charlie would still be alive if it wasn't for George and how she killed her baby, completely twisting her words around, ignoring any context whatsoever. She then tells the jury how 
Sister Alice asked if she covered baby Charlie's face with a pillow, and Emily nodded. And Emily loses it in court, yelling at the woman how she's lying. But it is a terrible look for Emily. With the district attorney saying that not only did Emily kidnap her own child, she actually murdered her own child. So as Perry is trying to usher Emily out of the courthouse amidst all the reporters, they're asking him a bunch of questions, and he says, if you want a real story, go ask the district attorney why he didn't call his lead detective to the stand. But something catches Emily Dodson's eye, and it's a poster claiming that Charlie will be risen from the dead in a couple of days. So when she gets back in the car with Della, she says, it's all right. The district attorney is going to end up dropping the charges because Sister Alice is going to bring baby Charlie back from the dead, and how can you have murder charges if the baby's alive? That's how warped Emily's mind has become. Now, since he wasn't called to the stand, Ennis is just at home working on his car when Holcomb shows up, and Holcomb wants the truth. He tells Ennis, everybody knows that you're lying. How dirty are you? Did you kill those guys? Did you stitch that baby's eyes open? Ennis tells him, look, man, you're the one that got me into this. Shaking people down, the whorehouse. But Holcomb looks at him and says, you can't even compare the two things. So Ennis kind of comes clean and says he got hired to do a job and things didn't go as planned. And Holcomb asks him, who knows about this? Who can pin this on you? And it's not like Holcomb wants to do the right thing and talk to that person. No, he wants to know who can pin this on his partner because he wants to shut that person up. Now, while all of this hoopla was going on, Pete headed to Denver to look into the connection between Ennis and the kidnappers. But while going through some files, he doesn't find a connection between Ennis and the kidnappers. He finds a connection between the kidnappers and Elder Seidel. Because Seidel was in charge of hiring the kidnappers to do a job back in Denver when he was in charge of this company. And it's just the lead that they were looking for. So he heads back to California to let Mason know of the good news. But Mason is heading to track down John Hicks, and he goes to his address knocks on the door and Hicks says, yeah, you're that woman's lawyer, right? I've been waiting for you to find me. But when he opens the door, he's holding a shotgun. In episode seven, Jim Hicks tells Perry that the shotgun is really just for the coyotes. He also tells him that the plots of land, including the one that he's living on, were bought up by Herman Baggerly and some of the other members of the church because they thought it was going to be where they built the Olympic Village, but it wasn't. And the plots of land ended up becoming worthless. But Jim Hicks seems to be on Perry's side, and he shows him what he came for. The books that prove that the church was struggling financially. Which is great for Mason, because up until this point, he only had the one ledger, which is the one that they stole. But Hicks had kept the rest of them and buried them away. So the next day is Good Friday, and him and Della are heading into the court. And Perry tells Della that his plan is to use Hicks to set up Seidel, and get Baggerly to admit that it was Seidel who brought him in on the Olympic deal, and that would help hammer away at the debt that the church had procured. But before Baggerly takes the stand, Hicks takes the stand. And Hicks admits that this SunTrust company was nothing more than a shell company. They had no employees and they didn't do anything. And this was the company that George Gannon was mailing checks to himself from. And Hicks explains that the Radiant Church of God was involved in these shady business practices because in two years it had become the biggest church west of the Mississippi. But you don't get to become a big church by not spending a lot of money. They took out a bunch of bad bank loans with horrible interest rates. And when it became obvious that those interest rates were going to be really tough to repay, they doubled down buying a radio station that Sister Alice could broadcast her sermons from. And this purchase came after the elders realized that the collection plates weren't even going to take care of the interest rate of their loans. And while looking at the numbers, that's terrible business, they were looking at it as Sister Alice is in the homes of thousands of Americans across the country. Hicks then puts all the blame on Seidel, saying that he was told to spread the debt around through these shell companies. Eventually, though, it got to the point where he couldn't do it anymore, so they brought in Gannon, and Hicks was told to train Gannon, and then they basically paid him off by giving him that plot of land. The digital attorney then gets up to try to cross-examine him and says, other than this one ledger, do you have any proof? And to his utter shock, Hicks says, yeah, I saved them all, and I handed them over to Perry Mason. And that's when Della's girlfriend gets up from her seat in the courtroom walks forward and hands Perry all of the ledgers. And Perry then goes to cross-examine the witness and says, if you are a trained eye and you look at these ledgers, roughly how much is the church in debt for? And Hicks says, a little over $100,000. And that number gets an audible gasp from the room because that was the number that was given to the Dodsons from the kidnappers. They then have a recess, and it can't come at a better time because Pete has shown up back from Denver. And he tells Mason that he was able to connect Ennis along with the other kidnappers. But better yet, he was able to connect all of them to Eric Seidel. And this gets Mason really excited, and he instructs Pete to follow Seidel around, make sure he doesn't get out of his sight, because he wants to put Seidel on the stand where he can tie all of this together. After the recess, Herman Baggerly takes the stand, where Baggerly admits that he was the biggest contributor to the church, although he no longer does it. And Eric Seidel was feeling the pressure of the financial burden, kept going to Herman Baggerly to get donations to keep the church afloat. 
but he went one too many times, and finally Herman Baggerly just cut him off. And three weeks later is when Herman Baggerly's grandchild got kidnapped for the exact sum of money that would have gotten the church out of financial debt. The district attorney gets up to cross-examine, but all of these people come in disrupting the courtroom, pretending to be Sister Alice, and they shut the courtroom down that day. Mason then rushes out of the courtroom to get a hold of Emily, who is leaving with Birdie, and he tells her, you need to start thinking about the possibility that the church does not have your best interest in mind. But Emily's brain is so warped at the moment that she can't even process that and leaves. She just can't envision how Sister Alice or the church wouldn't have her best interest in mind at the moment. Now, Pete did what he was told. He started following around Eric Seidel, and he finds him in a bank asking for an extension on one of the loans where the banker tells him, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. Pete continues to follow him, but the issue is Seidel is on to him and is able to lose Pete in a crowd of people. So Pete that night goes to Perry Mason's place to tell him, hey, I'm sorry, I lost Seidel in a crowd. But Mason is in a really bad mood because he just learned that Lupe has bought his farm. Mason had failed to pay his property tax five straight years, and the city put his property up for sale, and Lupe bought it. She's giving him a month to get out. And Mason feels like he has just been played by her. So when Pete tells him the news that he lost Eric Seidel, the one person that could really tie this whole thing and win the case for them, Perry Mason loses his shit on him screaming at him and yelling at him. And it gets too much for Pete to the point where he stands up and says, you know what, pay me out. If you want a private investigator, go get Officer Drake. I'm done. And then he leaves. Now, while Mason was blowing up on Pete, Della was meeting with the Assistant District Attorney Hamilton Berger. And Della is asking him to put an injunction on digging up the body of baby Charlie, but he's not willing to do it. Although during this meeting, you do learn that Hamilton Berger is also gay, just like Della, and they both feel like they can confide in each other because of it. Now, the next day after losing Pete, Seidel frantically calls up Ennis, worried about getting caught, knowing that if he gets put on the stand, he's going to crumble. Ennis tells him to go to San Diego for a couple of days, lay low, enjoy a vacation, and eventually Mason's going to stop looking for him. The case will go on, the case will end, and Seidel will be able to come back. And Seidel is starting to feel really guilty about what they did to baby Charlie. But Ennis quickly tries to change the subject, telling him that he'll give him a ride to the bus station. Although when Seidel goes to get in the car, Ennis starts stabbing him repeatedly over and over again until Seidel's lifeless body is lying on the road as Ennis makes sure that he will never talk about what they did. So as Seidel is getting shanked, Perry Mason is lamenting the fact that he just lost his family farm when Officer Drake finds him. And Drake has also been looking into the case. He was able to get the case file from one of the secretaries of the police station, and he started poking around and found a motel where the kidnappers were held up at. And one of the maids at the hotel reveals to him that two guys showed up with a baby that was crying nonstop, and then a third guy showed up with his Asian wife and the Asian wife was able to get the baby to stop crying. And they're pretty sure what that woman described was Ennis getting a girl from the brothel. So Mason and Drake head over there. They want to question some of the girls, but they need to tiptoe around it. And only Mason is allowed in because they don't serve black people. So Mason is looking over one of the menus, trying to pick out what girl he wants. And he's taking a while until finally he asks for a girl that is breastfeeding. And the madam gives him one. And when Mason gets her alone, she starts to undress, but Mason says, no, I just want to talk. The issue is there's a big language barrier. Even with the language barrier, though, Mason is able to find out that, yes, Ennis did show up, and he did take one of the girls to take care of one of the babies. But she has since died of heroin because most of them are addicted to heroin. Although Mason isn't able to question her anymore because these goons show up and start throwing him out of the place. And it looks like they're going to really do a number on him until Officer Drake shows up, saves the day, knocking the one out, and dragging Mason back. Mason then heads to the coroner's office where the coroner lets him know that, yeah, they did get a Jane Doe, and she fits the description. She's got the needle marks and everything. And Mason and asks him, what would happen to a baby that was being breastfed by a girl who was doing heroin? And the coroner, looking shocked because he knows what Mason is getting at, says the baby would suffocate, which is exactly what happened to baby Charlie. And now Mason has been able to figure this whole thing out. The issue is the next day is Easter Sunday, aka the day they're going to raise baby Charlie from the dead. And Mason heads over to the cemetery, which is jam-packed full of people. Sister Alice has a bunch of supporters there, but she also has a bunch of detractors there as well, like Elder Brown, who on Good Friday interrupted one of her radio broadcasts as a little appetizer to what would happen on Sunday, bringing forward the man that she, quote, healed on the air the previous week, who told her that the healing only lasted a couple hours, he's back in the chair. And it wasn't a good look for Sister Alice, who said that he's back in the chair because he lacked faith. So this is a big moment for Sister Alice. And Perry knows it, and he's trying to get through to them, begging them not to do this, but they're hell-bent on it. Sister Alice goes through this whole charade, touching the casket, saying a bunch of words, but when they open up the casket to everybody's surprise, there is no baby there. 
Not alive, not dead, nothing. The casket is empty. And Elder Brown immediately screams that she's a heretic, and a riot ensues. Perry grabs Emily, and along with Della, they get the hell out of there. Birdie also grabs Sister Alice, and they're pretty banged up, bleeding from getting cut open, and they also get out of there. But as they're making their way back to the church, Birdie instructs the driver to make a right when everybody else is making a left. And when they do that, they come up upon a street where a baby just so happened to be found in the middle of the road. And Birdie gets out and says, this is Charlie Dodson. Sister Alice, you did it. But Sister Alice gets out of the car knowing full well that she didn't bring that baby back and that Birdie had orchestrated this whole thing to just save face. And this is yet another example in their toxic relationship that you actually got a really good look at earlier in the episode when Birdie and Sister Alice were moving from Canada as she was just a teenager and they'd run out of gas. And to get into town, Birdie offered up Sister Alice to this guy to get molested. So Sister Alice, seeing the lengths that Birdie just went to, pisses her off and she ends up running away. Episode 8 picks up the night of Easter where the Radiant Church of God is frantically looking for Sister Alice. Birdie is getting stitched up back in her house and they've got a bunch of cars out looking for her, but they can't find her. And it's left Birdie alone with this mystery baby. But she wants to get word to Emily Dodson about baby, quote, Charlie. And Emily Dodson is at Della's house and it's been decided that she's going to stay there for the night. It leaves the two to have a conversation where Emily says that in a way it's going to be a relief when she gets sent to the gallows because she knows how she looks to the jury. And if she were in their place, she would look at her the same way. But the truth is, she's just a woman who's mourning the loss of her child and wants her child back. That same night, Della goes to meet with Perry, Hamilton Berger, and Detective Drake. And they're going over the plans on what they're going to do in court the next day. And Perry really wants to call Detective Ennis to the stand and pin him down on this. He's got all the facts, he's got all the information, and he could force him to get a confession on the stand. But Hamilton Berger says, nobody confesses on the stand. It never happens. And the more that Hamilton Berger hammers this point home the more that Perry is getting upset because he knows that Ennis did it. Perry then looks at Drake and says, did you feel like you were about to break on the stand? And Drake says, no, you were drowning out there. I threw you a lifeline. Berger's advice is to rest the case. He tells Perry, you've already got the jury looking at the 100 grand. There's your reasonable doubt. Don't call anybody else. But that's not what Perry wants to do. He wants to hammer Ennis for this, even though to a lot of people, it's going to look desperate. And after Berger leaves, Drake looks at Perry and says, you know, he's right. You only go in on Ennis if you know you've got him and you don't have him. And that's when Della speaks up saying that they should call Emily to the stand. And everybody thinks that's a terrible idea. When Perry goes outside to get some air, Della comes out and tries to plead her case about why Emily should take the stand and she brings up how she's even been prepping her a little bit and she's ready to take the stand and she deserves her voice to be heard but perry feeling the pressure of this case ends up lashing out at della and at one point brings up her girlfriend saying what you didn't think i didn't know and della says no i thought you knew i just didn't think you'd ever throw it in my face like this it gets pretty awkward and della says i'll type up some questions for emily once you come to the realization that it's the right call to call her to the stand and then Della leaves. And while those two were having it out outside, Drake was inside calling his wife, giving her an update on the case, but also looking in the classified ads for new jobs. The next morning before court, Perry ends up calling Pete to meet up because he's just about out of moves. And he really needs Pete's help. And Pete says, so we're just going to rush past an apology, huh? And Perry kind of apologizes, saying he knows how hard Pete works. And how he just hasn't been himself lately. But Pete says, no, maybe this new you is you. But Pete also says, all right, what do you need? And Perry gives him instructions. Perry then goes to court where he does end up calling Ennis to the stand. And he does what Hamilton Berger told him not to do. He tries to grill him on the stand. And he points out all of the facts. But just like Hamilton Berger said, Ennis doesn't break on the stand. It gets to the point where Berger actually stands up in court saying, he's not going to break, Mason. And in fact, he doesn't. At this point, Perry realizes he probably should call Emily to the stand. So they do so, and at first, Emily performs pretty well, telling her side of the story to the jury that she was just a housewife in a loveless marriage that got taken advantage of. Matthew Dodson wasn't nice to her, and George Gannon comes along and woos her. And the night that baby Charlie got kidnapped, George Gannon kept her on the phone for an hour distracting her while men broke into her house and stole her child. And all she wanted was her child back. But she had nothing to do with the disappearance of baby Charlie. And it seems like a lot of people on the jury and in the courtroom are sympathetic to her case after she says what she said. But that's when the district attorney gets up to cross-examine her. And he really keeps hammering home the fact that she cheated on her husband. And she had sex in a motel room while her baby was crying next door. 
and the district attorney, who at this point is kind of grasping at straws, says to her, it's your fault that baby Charlie is dead because your affair with George Gannon directly led to baby Charlie's death. Isn't that right? And Emily has to admit that, yeah, that is correct. And as her and Della are leaving court that day, she's just kind of in this malaise state. But as she's walking down the steps to her car, somebody comes up and slips her a note. Perry is watching this all go down from afar, and that's when he hears Ennis and Holcomb behind him. And Ennis says, you know, you put on quite a show in there. It almost made me feel sorry for her. And Perry says, you know that she didn't do it. We all know that she didn't do it. And that's when Ennis looks at Holcomb and says, hey, didn't he say something about catching the real killer of baby Charlie at the start of this thing? And that's the straw that breaks the camel's back for Mason. And Mason ends up punching Ennis in the face. When he does that, Holcomb jacks him up and says, if you ever touch my partner again, they're going to find your body floating in the river. And then Holcomb and Ennis get out of there like two schoolyard bullies. That night, Mason is trying to go through his closing statement when Lupe shows up with $7,000 and a bottle of alcohol saying, all right, here's your offer. I'm going to pay off all your debts and you're going to get the 7K in my last bottle. It's a fair offer. But Mason, who is agitated at this point, tells her that he can't take the $7,000 because that would be an agreement. And now that he's a lawyer, he's just going to tie all this up in court. Lupe starts to leave, but then comes back and says to him that there's 30 airstrips in Los Angeles. And once Prohibition ends, there's going to be about five. And the deck is already stacked against her because she's a woman. The deck's even more stacked against her, though, because she's a Latina. So she's kind of pleading to Mason to stop delaying the inevitable. But Mason doesn't want to focus on that right now because he's having trouble with his closing statement, knowing that the deck is really stacked against him with this case. But something must have changed between that night and the day that he has to address the jury because he gets up there and shines. He tells him that Emily was nothing more than a woman who had an affair and whose baby was unfortunately taken from her in a heinous act. And because it was so heinous, we all want blood. We want someone to pay for it. But that doesn't mean that Emily Dotson should have to pay for it because she's already suffered enough. And in the courtroom, it says to seek truth. And the truth is that Emily Dodson had nothing to do with the kidnapping of baby Charlie and the death of baby Charlie. And this closing statement to the jury is very long, but in it, Mason makes a lot of good points. On the flip side, when the district attorney gets up, he says, okay, Mason, you want to seek truth? Here's the truth. She was arrested for those crimes and she admitted to those crimes. So Emily Dodson should die for those crimes. And that's it. The jury gets up to go deliberate, and it's taking a while. On day three, Perry is waiting at the court to see if the jury has come to a conclusion when Della shows up giving him dinner for the night. And Mason apologizes for how he acted the previous night, but she says, don't worry about it. If we're going to work together, every once in a while, we're going to say some stuff that we just shouldn't. And Perry's a little surprised, saying, you want to do more of this? And she says, well, yeah, having a job is better than not having a job. But that's when they find out that the jury hasn't come to a verdict yet. And it takes five days for the jury to come to a verdict. In that five days, Paul Drake went into his precinct and handed in his badge and gun and the money that they tried to pay him off with and quit. But on the fifth day, everybody shows up back in court, including the media, and the judge has a note from the jury that he's going to read and he doesn't want to be interrupted. And the first line of the note is, I'm sorry, we tried. And that's when reporters start getting up, frantically leaving the court because they know what's going to happen and they're trying to get word to the editor. And the news is that the jury is deadlocked. And it forces the judge's hand to come down with a ruling of a mistrial. Now, it's not the ideal situation. The ideal situation would be if Emily Dodson was acquitted, but it's pretty damn close. And it leaves the district attorney fuming mad, giving a death stare to Mason as he's leaving. And Mason's thrilled because in a way, he kind of just won his first court case. Now, both Mason and the district attorney go outside and address the media. And the district attorney is playing it off like it's not a big deal. There's always somebody on the jury that wants to be a contrarian. Happens all the time. And he's doing a pretty good job of playing this thing off until one of the members of the media asks, did you blow this case? And the DA laughs saying, no, I didn't lose this case. It was a mistrial. This isn't going to affect my candidacy for mayor. Let me ask you a question. What's it like to walk around with half a fucking brain? So you see the cracks in the district attorney. Now, while Mason is thrilled about the outcome, he plays it off to the media like he's pissed off, saying how it's ridiculous that Emily Dodson wasn't acquitted, how she never should have been arrested for the crime in the first place, and how it's ridiculous that she's being painted out to be a victim by the same media members who are now interviewing her. And during this impromptu press conference, he ends up seeing Holcomb from a distance and yells at him, hey, where is he today? Are you still towing that blue line? You get out of here. Kick rocks. But then you get an idea of why it was declared a mistrial. Because while Mason and the district attorney and everybody was leaving court, Pete Strickland was meeting with a juror to pay him off. Because that thing that Mason wanted him to do was to pay off a juror to make sure that it was deadlocked. And the juror says, hey man, I'm just curious, but what were the others getting? And Pete has no idea what he's talking about. He says, you know, the other two jurors. I just want to make sure I'm getting what they got. And that's when Pete realizes, holy shit, Mason did it. We never need to pay this guy off in the first place. Mason actually had this jury deadlocked. 
So that night, Pete goes to meet with Della, Mason, Emily, and they're all kind of celebrating this mini win. But Pete gets up to get some air, and it's clear that something's on Pete's mind. So Perry follows him out and says, all right, what is it? And Pete tells him, I'm going to go work for Hamilton Burger's office. Mason thinks he's joking, that this has to do with money. So Mason says, all right, name your price. He says, no, it's steady work. I'm going to go work there. He's going to make me lead investigator. And Mason can't believe it. He goes, Pete, I need you here with me. But Pete says, no, you don't need me. You've got Drake now. Berger told me they're going after the money. And they're basically following the case that Mason laid out in court, trying to pin this on the Radiant Church of God. So no matter how hard Mason pleads with Pete, Pete's mind is made up. He's leaving. And now that Emily is a free woman, she opens that card to find a baby's footprint. So she heads to Sister Alice's place where Sister Alice isn't there, but Bertie is. And Bertie tells her how Sister Alice is still missing. And this is the longest that Sister Alice has ever been away from Bertie. But all that Emily really cares about is this, quote, baby Charlie. And when Bertie brings her, quote, baby Charlie, Emily notices that it's not her child, pointing out the arms, the different colors and eyes. But that's when she decides to just go with it. So we picked this up a couple months after the trial, where Mason has come to his senses and agreed that Lupe's offer is fair. He leaves her a note saying the offer was fair, take care of the cows. And the Mason family farm now belongs to Lupe. And Hamilton Bertie Berger was a man of his word. He's got Pete on the stand as Pete is testifying to the actions of the Radiant Church of God. And they were never able to pin this on Ennis, but as Ennis and Holcomb are picking up their share from the Lucky Lagoon Casino, Holcomb tells Ennis, look man, I'll take care of your family. And that's when a couple of guys grab Ennis and drown him. Holcomb grabs the money out of Ennis' pockets, grabs a detective badge, and leaves his body there. Sister Alice never came back to Birdie, and it forced Birdie to start preaching just like she did with Sister Alice when they first started out with a small tent and a small congregation. But instead of Sister Alice by her side, now she has Emily Dodson by her side, as Emily is lying to these people saying how Birdie brought back her child. But in a way, it's kind of brought a purpose to Emily's life now. And then finally, there's Perry Mason, who has moved into E.B. Jonathan's old office. And he's having a conversation with Della, and Della is laying out her demands, saying that I'll answer the phones for now, but as soon as we have some money coming in, you're hiring a girl. And Mason kind of laughs at her and says, what are you going to do? And she says, everything I'm already doing now, doing everything that it takes to keep a practice afloat. And when we do go to court, I'm going to do all this lawyer stuff. And that's because you're going to send me to law school at night. And in two years, when I become a lawyer, it's no longer Mason and Associates, it's Mason and Street. And Drake is in the background loving every minute of this, egging her on to get more. But Mason kind of shoes them both off saying, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about this later because there's a client outside. And the client says that she's in trouble, but the big thing is she can pay the retainer. So they have their first client post-Dodson case. But after Mason meets with this client, he ended up heading down the coast because Drake ended up looking into something for him and getting an address of where Sister Alice is. And she's working as a waitress in a diner. And when Sister Alice sees Mason, she's shocked. She's changed her hair color, and she definitely wasn't expecting to see him. So the two go for a walk, and he gives her an update on what her mom's up to, but then the real reason why he showed up is because he wants to know what happened to baby Charlie's body. But she doesn't really have any answers for him. And as she's trying to leave, he says, hey, Did you really think you could bring back baby Charlie? And she looks him dead in the eye and says, didn't I? And then she walks off. Mason kind of chuckles to himself, but then he pulls out that matchbox with the stitch that he took from baby Charlie's body, and he lets it blow off into the wind. And that's how season one of Perry Mason ends. Thank you so much for getting this point of the video. I really appreciate it. Please consider subscribing to the channel. If you like the video, hit a thumbs up. If you don't, hit a thumbs down. If you know somebody that needs a recap of Perry Mason season one, there's a share button for a reason. I don't check the comments because normally the comments on YouTube are a cesspool. So if you wrote something nice, I really do appreciate it. Just don't take offense if I don't get back to you. Oh, and if you want my opinion on stuff, check out my podcast, Scene Invaders, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's on there.